Hi, this is Lori Lieberman with John Rott, celebrating 20 years of retrospectives on 3 SER and KC Radio. Let's go right right back to the beginning. You grew up in Switzerland, I believe. I did. I was born in Los Angeles, but um, my father, who uh, was a chemical engineer, wanted to make his business international, so we moved to Switzerland when I was about eight years old, and I lived there for until I went to college, actually. And what kind of music was grabbing your attention uh, when you were living there? You know... Um, at that time, uh, Dionne Warwick uh, was was huge over there. So along with some of the French artists like um, Johnny Hallyday and Sylvie Vertin, um, uh, there was uh, pretty much, you know, Dionne Warwick until my sister came back from college. And uh, this was in the late uh, 60s and brought back um, Judy Collins' Wildflowers. And for the first time, I heard... Joni Mitchell and uh, James Taylor, and, and that that really influenced me. A lot of people I've interviewed over the years can always uh, cite a, an older brother or sister as influencing their, their interest in music, so that was the case with you as well? You know, it was. I mean, she brought back a slew of different um, LPs, so she also brought back Janis Joplin and The Holding Company, and <laughs> she brought back... Uh, but I responded, you know, to, to Judy Collins. It resonated with me more. So when did uh, writing become a major focus for you? It was a focus for me from a really young age. Um, you know, because I moved around so much, uh, my diary pretty much became my best friend. So um, I I really never missed a day, and, and, I, and I don't know why I was thinking that at some point someone might think my you know, my journeys through uh, uh, adolescence would be, it would make for some fine reading. I think I envisioned myself like Anais Nin. So I was writing um, every day from the time I was about nine years old and I got my first diary. Do you remember how you, your first recording deal came together with, with Capitol Records? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had just come out to Los Angeles um, from college and I was singing in a uh, small club here in, in Los Angeles, and uh, two producers came to the club and heard me sing, and we started to work together, and they, um, the next thing I knew, we had a deal with Capitol Records where they would produce my records, and, uh, and, and so it was like a year, a year after that, we, we came out with my first album. Now, your early records came out at a time where there, there literally was an explosion of singer-songwriter types uh, uh, making a name for themselves. Was it difficult to, to stand out in the crowd amongst that, that flood of singer-songwriters that came out around that time? You know, at the time, John, I really didn't think about it. I, I just, um, I was so happy to be singing, so before I knew it, I was on that circuit with all those different singer-songwriters you're talking about, so it became a bit of a small family um, as soon as one of them would um, do a gig at a club, then I would come in, and, and you know, you met so many amazing people. And I was on the bill with incredible singer-songwriters from uh, oh, Eric Anderson and Randy Newman and John Stewart, and uh, uh, to you know, to comedians like George Carlin and Robert Klein and. And it was so much fun, and it was like a family, so standing out, you know, to be honest, standing out wasn't anything that I ever really wanted to do anyway. I'm really shy. I was probably in the wrong business because, <laughs> um, you know, just standing up in front of an audience just used to terrify me. Um, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have a guitar to hang to hide behind, so I was very, very happy to be exactly where I was. <laughs> Let's talk about your your association with songwriters Charles Fox and Norman Gimbel. I, I believe that it wasn't always a happy association. How did the the the, uh, the songwriting process work between the three of you? Um, it was uh, a process that Norman Gimbel was the lyricist and Charles Fox was the composer, and I was the 
muse, I think. I've never actually said it that way, but I think that's pretty much what it was. They were looking for someone they could write songs for, but when they they were a bit older than me, and, and when they found uh, someone like me, I was 19 years old, they found they really couldn't write for someone my age and and, and, and identify with really what I was going through at that time. So uh, Norman Gimbel would, uh, you know, I'd, I'd go through through and and I would share my diaries yeah. with him and he would fashion songs a- after my my life um, uh, so that uh, they were very very autobiographical it was really a, a time where I didn't have much confidence in my own writing and uh, and and I was really impressionable so I was very happy to give most of what I had away and that meant my my secret thoughts, my um, experiences, and, um, and, and, uh, and that's what the songs that they wrote, that, that's really where they came from. Uh, most teenage girls would, would uh, shudder at the thought of somebody going through their diaries. Was it intimidating for you at all? <laughs> it was all intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was um, you know... I of course selected the pages, but um, it, 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 I don't know. There was something so flattering. I thought at the time that they wanted truly for, for there to be a connection between me and the songs I was singing. I, I was actually very flattered. It wasn't really until later that I, I, I felt somewhat invaded. But then I'm kind of that way. You know, you can step on my foot, and and about a, you know a month later, I'll say, "Ouch." I don't really quite get it <laughs> <laughs> at the time. <laughs> now, I guess it would be impossible to, to talk to you and not bring up uh, the song Killing Me Softly. Everyone uh, knows the song, but it's not as common knowledge as it should be that, it, that it's yours. Does it disappoint you at all that uh, over the years, you, you, do you feel like you've lost ownership of it a little bit? I, uh, well, let's see. I think it never... Um, I, I, to be honest, though, John, it's almost like as the years have gone on, I feel like I've regained ownership. It's only after all these years that I am, when I hear the song, I, I'm sort of like, wow, that is, when when the lyric says, I heard he sang a good song, I heard he had a style, I mean, God, that's me. That's that's true. That's That was me. I, I They're singing about me. I went to that club. I went to see Don McLean, who I thought was so amazing, and um, and and wrote a poem on a napkin and, and showed it to my producers, and that's how the song was written. At first, because it was recorded quickly, and Roberta Flack heard my version, and she made it number one, it very quickly was not mine. I, I early on felt no ownership. Um, but as the years have gone on, I have identified myself more with it. Mm-hmm. You were a teenager when, when you wrote it, and it's a, quite a mature piece of writing for, for such a young girl. How would you describe yourself in, in those years? Well, I was about 20 years old, and um, I, well, if I were to describe myself, I was really shy. I was very, um, probably a little young for my age, and really impressionable, so that, you know, to go to a club and be completely mesmerized by someone singing wouldn't really happen to me at this age, but at that age, I was all but devastated. I couldn't believe that uh, he, it felt like he was, you know, reading my my letters and and, and, and reading my diaries, and it was, um, you know, I was a very serious young girl. I really didn't have too much of a sense of humor. Um, so I had no ability to, to distance myself from my feelings. I was super sensitive and, um, I didn't have a lot of confidence. Um, and I think that that played a huge part in giving the song away. Um, but it's kind of a lesson. The lesson of my life is that I was given a voice and how to use it has always been a challenge, but I'm definitely getting better at that now. You re-recorded the song again, again in later years. Was there something you were hoping to capture in a new recording that felt hadn't been captured in, in the past, either by your recording or, or others? 
I think so. You know, I revisit the song every 10 years. And I did re-record it in 94 with an album um, that came out um, called A Thousand Dreams. And I um, also added a musical uh, prologue to it, um, talking just in a few lines about about uh, uh, that it was a time long ago, and, and, and then it threaded into the song. And now it's about oh, 12, 13, 14 years later, and I've recorded it again this time with uh, a perhaps a more mature spin on it mm. but it's still I still find things in it that um, that I that resonate with me the song still does I think it's a beautiful song and um, I it sits well within my range and I have quite a fondness for that girl that went to the club to see that guy <laughs> I read a quote of yours uh, where you mentioned that uh, in the past you associated your, your career with an unhappy life. I, I, in what way was that? Hmm. Can I say that? Yeah. Huh. That I associated my career with an unhappy life, meaning that it wasn't the best time having a career? At the, uh, because I had quite a quite a happy life. I mean, uh, I've, I've had an amazing life. <laughs> um, but I think as a performer... I have just, um, you know, it's taken me a long time to um, to have some identity of my own on stage, and now I, I do love it. It's, however, not my most favorite thing to do. I'd rather be behind the scenes. I'd rather be recording and, and just do an appearance here and there. But in terms of an unhappy life, my life has been so fascinating. I mean, I'm just nothing but blessed. God, I've got an incredible... Um, family and 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 great friends and I've got my health. I live in a beautiful area of Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, and and it's all been just a, an incredible journey for me. Was there a disillusionment though with the music industry that led you to to walk away from it when you did? Oh yeah. Well, now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> yeah. You know, there is something that happened. I, I you know in the in the 80s, when music was changing, actually late 70s and, and early 80s, when music changed and shifted from the singer-songwriter to disco, um, I was one of those songwriters in Los Angeles that found herself in countless offices of insensitive executives who would drop the needle on a song that meant so much to me and take it off for a phone call, interrupt it, or do something like that. And I remember this one guy, it was a defining moment for me. I walked into his office for a meeting. He was a publisher, a well-known publisher. I walked in, he was on the phone, he looked up, gave me like just a minute, that kind of a you know gesture. Mm -hmm. I sat down and he kept talking on the phone and he wasn't even talking about anything really interesting. He was talking about dinner plans or something. And he kept talking while I was sitting there. And I looked at my watch and I thought, I'm going to give this like two more minutes. I gave it two more minutes. He was still talking. And I got up and I walked out. And for me, it was, it, 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 it was pivotal because that to me meant I am so done I, I can't do this anymore, and I did um, continue on in my life in a very private way for the next almost 10 years. I had babies, I had a great life in the mountains of Los Angeles, and I really, though I missed singing, I didn't think I was ever going to return to it until um, 10 years later when someone um, sort of coaxed me out of the shadows. Mm. You didn't stop creating though in that in that time away. You were still writing though, weren't you? Always, yeah. <laughs> always writing. And I and I I had, um, which was a surprise to everyone, in, including my my husband at the time, um, that I had this box really of of songs that I had been writing. I, I always, it's always been something that I've needed to do more than that I've wanted to do. Right, but you kept those writings pretty much to yourself. You didn't um, didn't show them to anybody. No, I didn't. In <laughs> fact, I felt somewhat 
ashamed, you know, I, I don't know why that came into it, but I think I did. I felt this was my secret not to be shared with anyone. And I think when you put something aside, even if if it's something that you love, a passion of yours, when you put it aside, you're not fully who you are. And so I don't think I was fully who I was. Um, and when I began singing again, it was with a new sense of gratitude and uh, respect for for a part of me that um, that I, I can't I can't really hide away again. So, was there a, a defining moment or a particular thing that um, made you the time was right now to feel comfortable about showing your work to others again? Well, there uh, when I think I'd had a dinner party. And a gentleman came, a neighbor came, and he recognized an old uh, poster of mine on the wall. He had had my albums, um, and he had a, a very small record company, an audiophile record company. That didn't feel threatening to me at all. And um, he proposed that we do an all-live album in a beautiful theater and um, gave me a budget to do it. And that that was the defining moment where I thought, you know, yeah, I can I can do this. And it was, and I've maintained throughout all these years. I'm I'm I've stayed away from those guys in those offices <laughs> that are on telephones. I just choose not to deal with them. And I can't tell you how happy how happy I've been. Do you feel like you've got a much better control over over your career now in, in this time around? Oh, I. I do, and what the cool, the, the coolest thing that's happened is that I've reconnected with, uh, with an incredible and devoted fan base. So that you know, through the internet or, 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 or through this small record company of mine, um, I, I've found that actually my music, both early and 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 recent has had an effect on, 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 on some people, and, and it's meant so much to me. Also during your time, you did uh, some backup vocal work for, for other artists, uh, Leonard Cohen being, being one. Uh, was that a, one way that you could stay active in the music industry but step away from the limelight, so to speak? Oh, I guess so. You know, I think so. I think it was something that uh, just these sort of opportunities came and and, and I would do it and it was a just like a flicker and a flash you know of 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 that which was great and and being on the road with Leonard Cohen was was pretty incredible but my saving grace is that i think i put it in its right perspective it really was just a, you know it it was just what it was it was a lot of fun it was an interesting experience so has your your method of uh, of creating music changed uh, over the years? Do you approach uh, a new project differently now than, than say you would have uh, before that extended break you had? I I do because every single time I used to write a song, well, every time I used to have an idea for a song, I would think I got to get somebody else to write this. Well, that's changed. And then every time I would write a song, I would say. Oh, I got to get somebody to play the piano for this, and that's changed because I've become the piano player. Or, gee, I, I, this would be great with a guitar. Got to get somebody, and now I I play the guitar. I've got to get somebody to produce this, but now I'm the producer. <laughs> and what the cool thing is is that now that I'm have expanded my writing, and 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 my uh, and my brain, <laughs> that now I'm also orchestrating so that. Um, I have I, I've been doing string arrangements and horn arrangements, and um, I, I never felt, even though even though I'm I'm in my fifties, I've never felt more excited about my music ever, ever, ever than I am now, ever. Do you think looking back now is probably a break you needed to have? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think so. I'm just so grateful that I found it again. And and it's just pure joy for me. It's not to say that I'm writing mindless and 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 just you know happy songs. They're serious, but but what a what a growth. So it, it's been incredible. 
What about uh, performing live, Laurie? What, what's the extent of your um, your live performances these days? Well, I've basically been socked away in the studio. I can't even tell you how long I've been working on this project, but it's going to actually come out next month. Um, and then I'm going to do a, a, a tour. It's uh, with select places on the East Coast, the West Coast. I want to go back to um, the Netherlands where I've had an incredible, great um, fan base, so I'm, I want to tour back there. And uh, and some some places in Europe, and I've never been to Australia. Uh, well, it's not too I would late. love to go. <laughs> Maybe yep. I'll do, it, I'll do a duet with Bindi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think we've, we've all had enough of Mindy down here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just today, this is an aside, I was just today watching her show. It's so cute, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, so tell us about this upcoming release. Uh, I'm sorry? Tell us about this, this upcoming uh, album that we'll see next month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, I've done, let's see, seven songs are songs that I've written. And for the first time, although I don't want to mention it, I feel like if I do, someone else will pick up these songs and I'll lose my opportunity. But uh-huh. five, of them are, five of them are cover songs, songs that I've loved, songs that you would recognize with a different orchestration and a different um, take on them. And uh, um, it's a basically it's an acoustic record, but it's got full on. Um, some of the tracks have full on, very interesting kind of strings and, like I said, interesting horn arrangements. There's a lot more rhythm in this. I used great great musicians from California, and um, uh, it's a it's just a very accessible. I've never really even talked about it. You're the first time even describing it to, but I, I think I think that the people who know my music will be pleased and surprised. Excellent. So the cover songs. What what criteria would you use in choosing a song to cover? What what has to uh, what has to be right about the song to make it one that you'd want to um, interpret? Mm, something that has some history for me. I mean, there's a couple of them that are very old. Uh, I'm not talking, I don't mean like Grishwin old, I mean 60s. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, two of them, you know, I, are songs that were in, in my life growing up. Um, and the other ones are ones that just could say things that I wasn't, that I'm not able to. And um, uh, there's um, a, a Paul Simon song. I love Patty Griffin. I don't know if you know her. Yeah, she's just been here, actually. she's an incredible songwriter. Yeah, amazing. And uh, there's an Emmylou Harris song. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I just... Uh, songs that, that really just mean a great, great, great deal to me that really, really resonate with what I'm feeling. Fantastic. Also, songs that have an incredible, beautiful melody. <laughs> well, we look forward to that. And, and just to finish up, Laura, yeah. <laughs> what would you um, give as your main piece of career advice to somebody just starting out, out in music? Oh wow! I I, I don't want to say anything as trite as "never stop" or any of that. I think I just want to say, either way. If music means something to you, there's no getting away from it. It's going to find its way no matter what. You can try to do other things, but you won't be fully who you are unless you incorporate that in your life as well. Um, Because it really is your soul and your spirit. And uh, without it, um, you're really half of what you could and should be. I think that's my my advice is don't let it go don't let it go it may not pay off in the way that you want but don't let it go that sounds like excellent advice in life not just in music yeah yeah exactly i think so great laurie thank you well, so John, much thank for your time you 
so much. I appreciate, I really do appreciate this, and uh, and I hope we'll stay in touch. It's great to hear you bursting with enthusiasm for music still after all these years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <And> we, <laughs> Can I take my teeth out now? <laughs> <laughs> we said, we I've got a jar right here by the bed. I'll just take them out. <laughs> uh, I'll send you the new CD when it oh, comes out, be fantastic. Tom, you take good care, okay? We sure hope we do get to see you out here, with or without Bindi. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, John. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.